This evening we're uh, in Psalm 147. We're going to be looking at verse 5, but since verse 5 is the reason why the Lord, or at least the psalmist says what he says in the rest of the psalm, I thought we would go ahead and read it uh, to give us a taste of the wisdom of God and the knowledge of God, as well as his power, his strength to bring these things about. So let's read Psalm 147, beginning in verse 1 through verse 20. And may the Lord grant us his blessing as we hear his word. The psalmist writes, praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and praise is becoming. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He counts the number of the stars. He gives names to all of them. Great is our Lord and abundant in strength. His understanding is infinite. The Lord supports the afflicted. He brings down the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praises to our God on the lyre, who covers the heavens with clouds, who provides rain for the earth, who makes grass to grow on the mountains. He gives to the beast its food and to the young ravens which cry. He does not delight in the strength of the horse. He does not take pleasure in the legs of a man. The Lord favors those who fear him, those who wait for his loving kindness. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion. For he has strengthened the bars of your gates. He has blessed your sons within you. He makes peace in your borders. He satisfies you with the finest of the wheat. He sends forth his command to the earth. His word runs very swiftly. He gives snow like wool. He scatters the frost like ashes. He casts forth his ice as fragments. Who can stand before his cold? He sends forth his word and melts them. He causes his wind to blow and the wind waters to flow. He declares his words to Jacob. His statutes and his ordinances to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any nation. And as for his ordinances, they have not known them. Praise the Lord. Now, as I thought about this psalm, it really gives to us a catalog of the things that God does in his vast understanding and his wisdom. And certainly it's expressed to us in this psalm in terms of what God did for his old covenant people. But I thought we could sort of look at this in terms of what he does for us in the new covenant. And of course, asking the question, how is it that God can do all the things that he actually does? Consider, again, just the things mentioned in this psalm, that God, in his infinite understanding and knowledge, counts the stars, and he actually gives names to all of them. I think the number of stars that are in the heavens are probably more than the number of grains of sand which are on the seashore. That God, in his wisdom, controls the weather. He's the one who set up everything the way that he did in this world. He's the one who causes the heavens to be covered with clouds so that rains come and provide water for the earth fills the lakes and the inland seas with water. It says here in his word that he gives snow and frost and ice and then causes the wind to melt it. I think we're all familiar with the snowpack in the mountains and how that's one of the main sources, I believe, of our water. It fills our reservoirs. The Lord is the one who causes that. That's what makes our rivers flow and our canals to flow, and that's what makes our food grow, at least uh, part of it. Uh, God is also at work making the plants grow and producing the food, and as we also know from the drought that we're involved in as a nation, he's the one who shuts the water off when he wills. But he provides food for all of his creatures through this wise way, including us. He's also the one who builds up his church, gathering his people out of the world, people like you and me. And he gives you his words, his statutes and his ordinances, the psalmist writes, not only to show you the way to life, how you might be saved, but also how you might live to give glory to him and also that you might experience his blessings. He writes in here that he works in your hearts to heal you spiritually. And it's, it's interesting how the Lord does this because he doesn't just zap you with spiritual health and strength. You know the Lord. 
often takes you down a very difficult road, tries you to the very end of your, of your endurance and even beyond in order to bring about things that you think that these would actually hurt. You think this would actually take away from you, but it adds to you. God knows exactly what to do. He blesses you and he blesses your children. He protects you. He comes to your aid when your enemies attack you. And at the same time, it says that he overcomes your enemies. He grants to you peace. And again, God does this in such a wise and uh, powerful way. Now, for all these things, the psalmist says that you should thank the Lord, you should praise the Lord, and certainly what's implied in this psalm is that you ought to love him for it. I mean, the praise that you give to the Lord isn't just, you know, the words that you speak, it's not just the actions that you commit, but it's also the heart that is involved in it. And so when you thank him, when you praise him, you should do this out of a heart filled with love for what he has done. And of course, that's what we're looking at this evening, is why it is that you and I should love God, why we should love him, not only for the things that he does, but also for the things that he is, for his characteristics, his attributes. Now, how is it that God is able to give all these blessings in the face of all the bad things that actually happen in this world? Well, the answer is actually given in verse 5. Great is our Lord and abundant in strength. His understanding is infinite. God is able to do these things by his great power. He can do whatever it is he wants to do. But we do need to understand that this power is guided by infinite understanding, which by this I understand his limitless knowledge and the wisdom that he needs to take that knowledge and actually apply it to the things in this world to bring about his good and righteous ends. So this evening we're going to focus on that second part, his infinite understanding. And really as we go through this um, particular attribute of God, we can't help but see how it benefits us, uh, each one of us that know the Lord. But let's also understand that if God did not have this attribute, he would not be the God that you know. He would not be worthy of your love. This is really another one of his infinite, well, his infinite perfections that makes him to be lovely, that makes him to be so desirable, a reason why the people of God love him. So we're going to look at two things this evening. First of all, that you should love God for his infinite knowledge. And second, that you should love him because of his infinite wisdom, that he is able to apply what he knows to your life in a way that brings about good things, blessings for you and for me. Now, because uh, we're talking about something t tonight that, um, well, that really has to do with uh, infinity, <laughs> again, everything that God has is infinite, but when it comes to his knowledge, Sometimes understanding how this works can be a little bit difficult, so some parts of this are going to get uh, a little bit deep, and, and hopefully uh, you'll be able to follow what I'm saying. Hopefully I'll understand it well enough to be able to explain it to you. <laughs> so let's begin with his infinite knowledge and why you should love him for it. Now, what does it mean that God has infinite knowledge? Well, first of all, it means that there's no boundaries, just as it applies to God's being, that he is infinite, there's no, there's no boundary, there's nothing that surrounds God or encompasses God, but he basically is everywhere at once. He extends everywhere in every direction and never comes to an end. He is infinite. The same thing is true with regard to his knowledge. There is nothing that God does not know. There is nothing that God can learn. Talk about a a know-it-all, that God is that. Now, you've seen, uh, I hope, well, I'm, not that I hope, but I'm sure you've seen at some point, uh, maybe in um, stores or maybe in a carnival sideshow, these games, you know, that they have. Sometimes you, you see this big jar that's full of gumballs, and there's um, a prize if you can tell them how many gumballs are in the jar. 
Well, you, you know that you don't know how many gumballs are in there, but God certainly knows. What if you had to guess how many grains of sand there were in the entire world on every beach in the world? Do you think you would have any uh, chance of guessing that number? Well, you know, the fact is, God doesn't have to guess. He doesn't have to guess how many gumballs in the jar. He doesn't have to guess how many grains of sand on the sea or even in the entire world because God knows exactly how many there are. God knows everything. And because He knows everything, there is absolutely nothing that can take God by surprise. He knows everything that is going to take place in the world. He even knows everything that would happen under any given set of circumstances, which is interesting because, uh, again, that's what infinite knowledge means. There are certain things that happen in the Bible where the question was asked, God, what if, God, what if I stayed here? What would happen? Uh, for instance, David, when he was in Keilah, he understood that Saul was coming when the men of the city told Saul that he was there, and this is the time when Saul was hunting David. Uh, David says, Lord, if I stay here, what's going to happen? Will the men of the city give me over to Saul? And the Lord says, yes, they will give you over. And so David left, and that never happened. But God knew it would happen if he stayed there. Same thing happened when Paul was on his way to Rome and on the ship and when the Lord said to him that every man has to stay in the ship or no one can be saved. God knew that if anyone left the ship, they would all die. But he also knew if they stayed on the ship, they would all survive. So God knows what will happen, not only what is going to actually happen, but he also knows what could happen under any given set of circumstances. He knows the answer to all the what ifs. His knowledge is comprehensive. Now, his knowledge, the Bible also says, is eternal. That God not only knows all things, but he has always known all things. He has always known what was going to take place. The Lord, as a matter of fact, never had to sit down, as it were, in, in eternity and try to figure out exactly what it is he was going to do or you know, how he was going to respond or what he would allow or what he would not allow in the world he was going to create because it's something that he has always known, something he has always desired to do. He's known exactly what he was going to do. Now, we haven't gotten to the difficult part yet. This is still the, the easy part to understand. God's knowledge is comprehensive. God's knowledge is eternal. God knows all things, not only actual things, but potential things, and he knows it from all eternity. Now, let's pause just for a moment and let's apply this. What does this mean for you? Well, first of all, it means that God knows you. God's knowledge of you is absolutely comprehensive. I mean, think about the psalm we just read. He knows everything about you. He knows when you would be born, when you were born. He knows the day that you are going to die. He knows every thought that you think, and he knows it before you think it. As a matter of fact, he's known it from all eternity. He knows every word that you're going to say, even before you say it. He knows everything that you're going to do. He knows everything that you will aspire to, to do, everything you will try. He knows everything that you're actually going to accomplish. He knows everything. And again, as I've said, he knows it eternally. He doesn't have to watch you to see what you're doing to learn about you. He doesn't have to guess, as it were, or extrapolate from what he sees you doing now as to what's going to happen to you in the future. He doesn't have to look down the quarters of time to see what's, what you're going to do in the future or what's going to happen to you because he has always known these things before you were conceived, before the world was created. Your entire life is an eternal idea in the mind of God. Everything you were before coming to Christ, everything you are now, everything you ever will be. He not only knows these things about you, but he knows them about everyone else as well. Now let's stop here. That's, that, 
as far as understanding the, the uh, knowledge of God, let's begin to apply this in the sense of why should you love God for this knowledge? Well, first of all, you need to understand that this is the reason why God was able to choose you in the first place. And I hope you understand by now that his choice is what actually saves you. And if you don't, hopefully you will by the time we're done with this particular point. But God knew you eternally. And knowing you, as Paul says in Romans 8, 29, he chose to set his love on you. God can't love what he doesn't know. But God knew you in advance, and God loved you in advance. And let me just deviate here for a moment to help you understand what this means, what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that God looked ahead and said, hey, it's a great guy, that's a great girl, I, I love you guys, and uh, I'm going to choose you because you're so great. That's not exactly what it means. You know, when we look at ourselves, we shouldn't say, well, it's no wonder God chose me you know, because I'm such a great person. That's not the way it is. The sad fact is that God knew you the way that you were apart from him, and he knew you would not be good. He knew exactly what you would be like. God knew the sin of your hearts. He knew the things you would think that were dishonoring to him. He knew the bad desires that you would have, the wrong things that you would do. He knew all of those things. And yet in spite of these things, he still chose to save you. He didn't choose you because he went of what he saw, because everything he saw was bad. But he chose you because of what you would become in the Lord Jesus Christ. And basically, why did he choose to put you in Christ? That had nothing to do with you had everything to do with him. But knowing you and knowing what you would become in the Lord Jesus Christ, he chose, he predestined you to become conformed to the image of his son, to call you, to justify you, eventually to glorify you. If God did not have this infinite knowledge to know all these things in advance, really he could never have chosen you because he wouldn't have known you. He wouldn't have even known you existed. So you should love him because, you know, for this infinite knowledge, because this is how he was able to save you. Now, it gets a little uh, deeper than this in just a moment, but let me just point this out. Understanding God's knowledge, his comprehensive knowledge of you, and the fact that he chose you, again, not because of you, but because of his plan, because of his good purposes, because that's what he wanted to do. That should give you a great deal of comfort when you fall into sin. And every single one of us here has and will again. You should love him because of his infinite knowledge, because this doesn't take him by surprise. He not only knew what you would do before he saved you, he also knew what you were going to do after he saved you. And I think you know as well as I do how it is when you fall into sin. First thing is you, well, often that you ask, especially if it's a serious sin, you ask yourself the question, how could a Christian do what I just did? How, how, that isn't even consistent with what the Bible says a Christian is. And then you begin to wonder, does the Lord still love me? Has he ever really loved me? Or have I just been kidding myself? And am I going to see heaven? Or am I going to end up in hell? Now, the reason why you wonder these things is because when you sin, especially when you commit big sins, it does grieve the Spirit of God. It quenches his work. And by quench, what the Bible means is the Holy Spirit's work is like a fire. When that fire is burning strong and bright, you sense the love of God and you know you're a Christian, but when it gets quenched, it's like throwing water on it. Thankfully, we understand from Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress that that fire isn't going to go out because the Lord continues to put oil in it, the oil of his spirit, it continues to burn and eventually will burn brighter and stronger. That's something we ought to thank God for right there as well. But it's not going to go out, but it does weaken the work of the Spirit of God. And when his work is weakened in us and his influence is, is less in us, then you don't um, sense his love as strongly as you did before. And that's why you wonder whether or not you're a Christian. 
But now remember that God chose you and he saved you knowing that you were going to do these things. Again, it doesn't catch him by surprise. It's not like some people conceive of God just sort of watching the people around him. Oh, there's somebody who just turned to Christ. Great. Well, I'm going to bring him into my family now and, and I'm going to you know, love this person. Oh, this person just sinned against me. Well, I guess he's out. Okay. That's how some people conceive of what God does. He responds to what you do. But that's not the way it is. God already knows what you were like. He knows what you are. He knows what you will be. And understanding all of that comprehensively, eternally, he chooses to save you and grants you life and says you will never perish. And so what you do from the time you become a Christian on doesn't take God by surprise. It doesn't change his purposes for you. It doesn't change his love towards you. It, it doesn't change his, his purpose to save you and to make you like his son. If it would have had a bearing on that, it would have stopped him from choosing you in the first place. So if you were a Christian before you committed that sin, you're still a Christian. If you're on your way to heaven, you're still going there. And the reason is because God doesn't change and because you haven't surprised him. He knew you were going to do this, and yet he still loved you, and he still chose you, and he still saved you, and he is still going to work that together for your good. So his infinite knowledge is the reason why God chose you. It's, it's how he chose you. We might say not the reason why, but it's how. If he didn't know you, he couldn't have chosen you. And that should give you great comfort because he knows you comprehensively. And even if you sin, you know he's not going to cast you away because he still chose you knowing you were going to sin. It hasn't taken him by surprise. But now here's another reason why you should love him for his infinite knowledge. And this is where it gets a little bit deep. God doesn't just know what's going to happen uh, in the world and everything that he's created. His knowing actually guarantees that it's going to happen. I can put it simply this way. If God knows what's going to take place in the future, in order for him to know it's going to happen, it has to happen, right? So God knows, if God knows that you're going to be saved, it's, it's something that must take place. Now let me just um, divert for a little bit here or back up a little bit. You know I like to use Jonathan Edwards as, as an example, and this is one of the controversies that he was actually in embroiled in in his day, uh, there were a group of people called Arminians. I think we, uh, we know something about them. Uh, they're the ones who believe that man ultimately makes the choice as to whether or not he's going to be saved. It's not God's ultimate choice, but it's man's choice. Well, the Arminians in Edward's day believed that in order for man to have a free will, and we believe in free will, we believe that everyone is free to choose what they want, we understand from what the Bible says that some people want things that are bad, and that's what they choose. And only the people who want things that are good will choose good things, but nobody wants to choose good things unless God gives them the grace to choose good things, and that's where the sovereignty of God comes in. So we believe in free will. But what the Armenians mean by free will is that everyone who exists in the world, everyone that God created is absolutely free to choose good or evil all the time apart from any intervention on God's part. They also believe that in order to make a free choice, the kind of freedom that God grants to every one of his creatures, the choice that a man makes has to be absolutely free. It can't be influenced. It can't be determined. It can't be something that absolutely has to take place. It has to be free. A man has to be able to choose one direction or the other direction at every point in his life. Well, as a matter of fact, the Bible does say that man does make choices like that. But here's a little bit of a, a wrinkle. Edwards responded that the fact that God knows what your choice is going to be actually makes that choice a certainty. If God knows the choice that you're going to make, if he knows that anything is going to take place, that thing has to happen. Otherwise, God could not know that it was going to happen. I hope that's clear. If God sees something is going to happen, if he knows it's going to happen, it has to happen. Otherwise, 
it wouldn't happen. I mean, or God couldn't know that it was going to happen. It has to be something that's absolutely certain. But now here's where Edwards went a little bit further and let's say stepped on the toes of the Arminians even a little bit more strongly. The reason why God knows that those things are going to happen is because he chose that they would happen. This is what he has planned. Now here's where it gets a little bit difficult to understand. Think about this for a minute. God knows what's going to happen. And if God knows it's going to happen, it's absolutely going to take place. Which means, of course, as God thinks about what's going to take place, he either approved what he, what he knew or he disapproved of what he knew. Now, if God did not approve of what he knew was going to happen, he wouldn't have let it happen, right? He would have made it work out some other way. So the fact that he, that he knows it's going to happen means that he actually approves that those things are going to take place. Now, his knowing what's going to take place and either approving or disapproving of something and making something stand or not stand is simply another way of saying that God was either willing or not willing that certain things would take place. But his willing, being willing that certain things take place and his being unwilling that other things take place is simply referring to his decree because that's what his decree is. It's simply his will. This is what I want to take place, God says, and that is his decree, that is his will, that's his purpose. Those are the things he approves of and all the things he disapproves of well, those are things that don't happen. Everything that happens are the things that God has approved of. So basically, his knowledge of what is going to happen in the future is really his decree. Now, if that's not clear, we can talk about that following the service. Now, why should you love God for this? For his foreknowledge. How does this become a reason to love God? Well, for this, this reason. If you are trusting Jesus Christ this evening to save you, that means that God knew that you would do that, which means that this was God's eternal plan or God's eternal purpose because, again, he eliminates all the things that, that he doesn't want to happen. All the things that happen are the things he approves of. They are a part of his plan. So your believing, your trusting in Jesus was a part of that eternal plan. And of course, the reason why he knew you would do this is because he knew he would give you the grace to believe. That was a part of his plan as well. But if God knows that he was going to give you this grace and you were going to trust in him because that's the only way you could do that, that is a part of his eternal purpose. And if it's a part of his eternal purpose, then you will be saved. So the point here is simply this, that if God knows that you would trust in him, that was his plan and you will be saved. It can't happen any other way. And again, that just goes in with what we saw before, that you're not going to do anything that's going to surprise God. He knows everything that you're going to do from now to the day that you die, and yet if you have grace in your heart this evening and you're trusting in Jesus, that means he's chosen you and saved you in spite of the fact that you were going to do those things. You are going to make it to heaven. His knowing these things is what guarantees that that's actually going to take place. So his foreknowledge, his comprehensive, eternal knowledge is what guarantees your salvation. I hope you see that as a reason why you should love God. Now, let's deal secondly with his infinite wisdom. And, and this, I don't think will take quite as long to understand this, but this is the second reason why you should love him is because of his infinite wisdom, his ability to take his comprehensive knowledge and to apply it in such a way that he, he brings about these blessings, especially the blessing of eternal life, in spite of all the things that are gonna to happen to you in this world. I mean, God knows of your sins. He knows of the trials, the temptations, the difficulties you're gonna to have to face, and yet he has so ordered things that they are going to help you actually achieve heaven. Now, God is so wise that he is able to bring good out of bad things. It shouldn't surprise us that when God ordains good things and good things come out of it, that 
God's able to do that. You know, I mean, if you do something good, good can come out of that as well. But the fact that God can bring about all these things we've just seen, not only that you will arrive in heaven, but that everything that happens to you in life along the way, that that is actually going to work for your good, that requires infinite wisdom. And we have plenty of examples of that shot throughout Scripture, that he's able to do these things. I mean, just one example would be that of uh, how the Lord actually saved his people from a famine that was coming into the land that was going to last for seven years. He saved his people through the evil actions of a group of brothers who hated one particular brother they had by the name of Joseph. They decided they wanted to kill him. But instead of killing him, they sold him as a slave into Egypt. And I think you know how the story goes. The brothers hated him. They sold him as a slave. They wanted to kill him. But they said, well, you know, why should we kill him? He's our brother. We should instead make some money off him. So we'll sell him as a slave. So they sold him as a slave into Egypt. And you know how Joseph ended up in Potiphar's house and how Potiphar's wife accused him falsely. How he ended up in prison where he interpreted a couple of men's dreams. How one of those men... Uh, finally left the prison and was lifted again into Pharaoh's household and became his servant. How Pharaoh had a dream and, and how the servant remembered that Joseph interpreted his dream and how that brought Joseph before Pharaoh. And how after he interpreted Pharaoh's dream, Pharaoh made him second to Pharaoh in all of Egypt. And how through that dream, Joseph also understood what was going to happen. And so he collected all the food that was in the land for seven years of plenty and then the seven years of famine came, and when the seven years of famine came, how the Lord brought his family into Egypt where they were saved and where they multiplied into a great host before the Lord brought them out to bring them into uh, their own land. Now again, the brothers just wanted to kill Joseph. The brothers then decided not to kill him but to sell him for a little bit of money, but that's what their intent was. That's what they wanted to do. That was their choice. And that was evil. But God had planned this for another reason altogether. And he actually worked his plan out through Joseph and saved his people. Now, you see, only infinite wisdom could take all the things that could feasibly happen down this, this you know, column, as it were, or this line of cause and effect to bring about these good results from these evil actions. God is able to do that. And not just in that example, but in, in everything. Another great example is the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Through the evil actions of men who hated Jesus, even God's own people, turned him over to the Romans, cried out for his crucifixion. The Romans took him and crucified him. Through that evil action, and it was purely evil on their part, God brought about the greatest good that could ever possibly happen for you and for me. And that is our salvation. When Jesus was crucified, he brought about the salvation of all of his people. Again, reminding us that God is able to work all things together for good to those who love him. And he is also able to work it out for the good, uh, well, his good and, and the good of his church overall. God has the wisdom, he has the knowledge, he has the understanding to bring all these things about. Now again, why should you love God for this? I think the reason is obvious. Because he is able to work absolutely everything that happens to you for your good. And if you love him this evening, that's exactly what God says he is doing. He is bringing good out of all the things you have to suffer in this life. Basically, what it means is that, that all these things that you do have to endure, all the grief that you might have to suffer, the hardship, the trials you have to go through, the temptations, and even the sins that you fall into that you, that you hate yourself for, all of those things have been planned by God, and he's going to work them together for your good. We already saw how he used the evil of men to bring about good results, good things. He even can bring good things from your own evil. One obvious way he does this is when you commit all these sins as a non-Christian and then the Lord saves you. Now he has a servant who loves him and praises him 
for all the kindness and mercy that he's shown to you. That's one way he uses your sins for your good and for his glory. But he continues to do that even after you have been saved. Now, you do need to realize that that's not an excuse for you to sin. I hope you understand that, that God isn't saying sin so I can work good out of it. As a matter of fact, you are commanded or exhorted by Paul when he says, shall we sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How can we who have died to sin still live in it? That's not what God wants us to do. But he still knows that you are going to fall into sin. And he is going to work those things together for good. And he can do that because he is infinitely wise. Now, the question we're asking this evening is this. Shouldn't you love a God like this? Do you love this God? Now, sometimes infinite knowledge and wisdom and knowing that God has the ability to do these things can be frightening. But it only frightens you if you don't know him. If you don't, well, if you don't have the assurance that this knowledge and this wisdom is actually being used for your good. Because God knows the actions of those who don't know him. And as a matter of fact, on the day of judgment, because he knows all those things and knows them eternally, he knows exactly what it is he's going to judge those who don't know him for. And nothing is going to escape his attention. He knows everything you will ever do. And he's going to bring those things into account. So if you don't know the Lord this evening, realize his infinite knowledge is a threat to you. But if you don't want it to be a threat to you, then turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and trust in him. Turn from your sins. And then you can know it will work together for your good. Then you know you will not have to be afraid. But if you do know him, this should comfort you and become a reason to love him. I mean, really, would you, considering how this already works to your, to your benefit, if you are a Christian here this evening, Consider what it would be like if God didn't know everything. What if he was ignorant? Uh, you know, there are actually people today who were convinced by Edward's discussion against the Arminians as far as, you know, what, uh, what God knows and what he doesn't know, and, and they agreed with Edwards. They said, you know what, Edwards, you're right. If God knows the future, then the things that he knows are absolutely going to take place, which means that there really can't be any freedom. There can't be any liberty. That's not true, but that's what they think. And so they said the only way to, to deal with that is to, is to understand or to believe that God doesn't know the future. And these people today call themselves open theists. The idea that the future is open, God doesn't know what's going to happen, he's learning as things go along, he's surprised when things happen, when somebody turns to him, he's delighted because he didn't know that was going to happen, and that's, you know, surprise, or things like that. Well, I hope you understand that a God like that is really not God at all, uh, because if he didn't know what was going to happen, then there, really there's nothing that could be certain. If this were true, then God couldn't really even guarantee that what he wants to take place would happen because, I mean, when you think about it, if he doesn't know what's going to happen, that means he doesn't even have a plan. Everything is just kind of happening the way it's happening, and God doesn't even know what it is. And if that's the way things were, then really there wouldn't be any certainty. There would be no guarantee that anything's going to work out the way God wants it to work out, and there's no certainty that it would be working out for your favor because even God doesn't know what's going to happen. It could actually end up destroying you in the end. And God wouldn't even know it was going to happen. And that means, ultimately, he doesn't even know if you're going to make it to heaven. And if he doesn't know that, then you certainly couldn't know it either. That is basically at least some of the consequences of having a God that is ignorant he couldn't guarantee that anything was actually going to happen. Now, thankfully, that isn't the case. Thankfully, we have a God who understands and knows comprehensively. He knows eternally. And God is using that infinite knowledge and that infinite wisdom not to work against you, but rather to work in your favor. 
that is the reason why you will actually arrive in heaven. God has a plan. And that's why he knows the future. And that's why he knows you're going to be saved. Now again, shouldn't you love a God like that, especially when you consider what the consequences are? And would you have God to be any other way than what he is? Do you love God? Well, I hope as you see more of what God is like, you'll understand that these things are perfections in him, things that you should love him for, that don't threaten you, of course, if you trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything that God is can actually work against you if you haven't trusted in him, and I hope you're beginning to see that as well. But if you have trusted in him, these are all reasons why you should love him and why it is he is so beautiful as he is. And again, it all boils down to God's love. His love is what causes all of his attributes to be lovely. Because if God had infinite knowledge and wisdom to do what he wanted in this world, but he didn't love, didn't love you, then I hate to think of the consequences of that. It would be terrifying. But the fact is, this infinite knowledge and wisdom is wedded with infinite love. And those two things together conspire for your good. And that's why God, that's why you should love him. That is why he is lovely. So I hope you do love him and see these things as so many perfections that make him all the more glorious and all the more beautiful. Let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask that the Lord would again show us more of himself and show us more of our own hearts as we listen to these things and understand a little bit more about what God is like to see in our hearts whether we really do love the God of the Bible. We're not just loving some God that we've constructed in our own mind, but the one who actually reveals himself in the pages of Scripture. So let's spend a few moments in prayer.